We have just finished looking at the proximate factors that influence behaviors. And now we're going to switch gears and spend the next little while looking entirely at animals behaving and trying to figure out why they're behaving the way that they do. Over the next number of episodes, we're going to be looking at animals behaving in ways that they need to in order to maximize their fitness. And we'll be asking questions on more of a fundamental level, like, why are they doing this? In the first of these episodes, we're going to be looking at survival. Now, survival has two aspects. One is that you need to feed in order to be able to grow and develop by getting all the nutrients and energy required to do so. But at the same time, you have to make sure that you don't become food for someone else. And so, being an animal behaving out there in the world, it is challenging to find food while attempting to survive. Because of this duality between eating and not getting eaten during attempts at survival, animal behaviors can place them in risky situations from time to time. So we're going to start by looking at seemingly risky situations and trying to figure out how and why they've adapted to contribute benefits to the fitness of the animals that are performing these dangerous behaviors. Here we're observing seagulls that are not leaving a vicious raptor alone. They're chasing after him, taunting him, generally harassing the bird of prey as much as possible. This is a mobbing behavior. But what we saw here was that we were seeing a bird of prey being chased by seagulls, which are not birds of prey. Seagulls are generalist omnivores, but the raptor has a very sharp beak and very sharp talons. It is a hunting machine. It's a killer. And seagulls are anything but that. They have webbed feet and a big clumsy beak. They're scavengers more than anything else. So why is it here that we have this David against Goliath situation, where the seemingly harmless bird is chasing after the very dangerous one? It seems like there's some kind of paradox going on. There needs to be an explanation as to why these seagulls are chasing the much more dangerous bird. Now the point of all that, from the evolutionary perspective, or what the ultimate function will be, is what is the benefit to the gulls? We will have to figure out what is the benefit of mobbing these predator birds. Because clearly there needs to be some benefit or this would be maladaptive. It would be selected against and it would no longer exist as a behavior. But this is a reasonably common behavior, mobbing predators, even when the mobbing comes from seemingly harmless animals. So the question is, why? What's the adaptive value here? What's the fundamental purpose of this behavior? Well, if it's an adaptation, it should be contextually dependent in the sense that there will be some places where the behavior will provide clear benefits and perhaps other contexts where the behavior will not. Because the behavior comes with obvious costs in time, energy, and of course the risk of injury. And this is generally true of all behaviors, in that behaviors don't come for free. In order for a behavior to be adaptive, the benefits must outweigh the costs. Presumably, by mobbing the bird of prey, the gulls benefit by some kind of protective element. And it presumably would not be protecting the individuals who were mobbing, because they're actually putting themselves in great danger. Presumably, they're protecting other individuals. And the hypothesis here is that because they're colonial nesting birds, they're protecting the colony from attack from that predator. Now that's a context, the colony in space and time. It doesn't exist everywhere. So therefore, because this mobbing behavior has extreme costs, we wouldn't expect that mobbing behavior to occur unless those clear benefits justify the potential costs. Studies have been able to show that colonial nesting animals like gulls and ground squirrels will use mobbing adaptively by increasing its intensity as predators approach the breeding colony and losing the urge to mob as the predators move farther away. By modifying the intensity of the behavior as it relates to the benefits to be derived from the context of protecting their family members, they're able to reduce the costs associated with the behavior by not engaging when those benefits are likely to be low or absent. One thing that we can see here 
is that behaviors are not necessarily on-off switches, that they often involve decisions that are made in terms of the optimality or the best time and place to engage in a behavior. Because behaviors will sometimes be more costly than beneficial, in which case they wouldn't be adaptive. In other, closely related gull species, mobbing behavior is typically absent because their evolution via natural selection had come up with other options for different circumstances. For example, cliff nesting, where instead of nesting in colonies on the ground, the colonies are found on cliffs. And because cliffs are much more remote and much harder to get to for predators, it's a safer place to be nesting with fewer attacks from those predators. As a result, these cliff nesting species have not evolved the mobbing behavior seen in the other gull species. Now, of course, no adaptation is perfect, and we can imagine that nesting on cliffs like this might come with its own perils, such as getting too close to the edge. Presumably, there is a certain amount of mortality from chicks falling off. But when the benefits of needing to deter predators outweigh the costs of accidental deaths, we can see that as being adaptive. Another way that we can reduce the risk of being predated upon is by not being the one that's eaten and having it be someone else instead. As a result, many animals will cluster near one another because when predators come along to eat one of them, the likelihood that you as an individual are going to be the one that's singled out for attack increases as the group that you're in gets smaller in size. The other side of that coin is that the bigger the group that you're in, the less likely that you as the individual are going to be the one that's taken away by the predator. So here we can see an evolutionary tendency for animals to group because of the safety in numbers that it represents. This is a concept known as diluting the risk, meaning that there is a risk that's out there, but the risk applies equally to all of them. And the more individuals that are out there, the less that risk applies directly to one individual in particular, and the more it's spread out over many, many individuals instead. One example of this is a behavior known as puddling. This is a behavior where mostly male moths and butterflies will drink water from mud puddles. The main reason that they're doing this is to gain minerals from the water, such as salts that they will package into their spermatophores upon reproduction. However, when the males cluster around these puddles to feed, we may note that there are lots of puddles for them to choose from, but it turns out that males tend to cluster in particular puddles and to not spread themselves out into their own independent puddles each. It turns out this is an adaptive strategy because it dilutes the risk of each individual being the one that's predated upon. The grouping behavior is adaptive because it lessens the risk of being exposed to potential predators. So what we're seeing here is that there are benefits to grouping and that these benefits can lead to behaviors which can be called selfish behaviors in some contexts where really it's a question of trying to make it so I'm not the one that gets eaten, but I don't mind if it's you, right? So by putting myself next to someone else, I'm sharing the risk that would otherwise be on me alone. So that can be seen as quite a selfish behavior because really I'm sharing the risk with others so that I don't have to have it all on my own or that I'm transferring some of that risk to others because I'm quite honest, I'd prefer that the predator eats one of you instead of me. And you, as a member of my species, probably feel the same way about me. And that's sort of a general philosophy translating into behaviors. That it will create selfishness in clustering because it's adaptive to spread the risk across more individuals and to lower one's own probability of becoming prey. But the benefits to grouping aren't just this probability of being captured versus not by predators. They can also be turned on their head in that the grouping can be used as a sort of warning if there is ever any kind of punch or kick or bite that can be inflicted when that is the case. Well, the more the merrier rings true in that context as well. Take, for example, the case of Africanized honeybees that will swarm and attack when threatened. And you can bet your bottom dollar I wouldn't want to go anywhere near that mass of angry bees right now. 
And so I think that we can infer what the benefit here is, that we note that each one of those individuals can carry quite a punch in terms of having the stinger with venom that they can inject, which is very painful, not just to us, but to most animals. And if an animal gets swarmed by a significant number of these, that can lead to death. So the benefits to these bees by grouping in numbers here seems quite clear in the sense that there is an aggressive or antagonistic message that they can use on the attack rather than on the defense. Well, there's more of a punch the more individuals that are involved in that aggressive attack. Now what about those animals that can't necessarily fight their way out of danger? What are the options available to them? If we look closely at this mottled rock surface, we might not notice that there's a toad here, as it is demonstrating a form of survival by attempting not to be observed by the predator. This animal is using camouflage to try in some way or another of avoiding detection. We know that camouflage must involve morphological or physiological traits that make an animal appear like their background, but there will be animal behaviors involved in effective camouflage use as well. The first and foremost behavior that is required in order for camouflage to be effective is to choose the appropriate background to display oneself. The modeled pattern on this spiny lizard here is reasonably effective in this leafy litter, but as soon as it finds itself in a different environment or a different habitat with a different backdrop, its camouflage is no longer effective. So you can see the behaviors are integral to the effectiveness of camouflage. They need to choose the appropriate substrate so that they can match the aspect of the environment that they're attempting to mimic. And the second thing is to behave as that environment does, in terms of movement, stillness, or pattern matching, for example. If you're meant to look like a rock, it is probably best to try to be as still as possible. Otherwise, we can think of stick insects, which have the morphology and physiology that make them look like sticks. But when they're at rest, the stick insects actually sway slowly from side to side, such as a branch on a plant would, allowing them to blend most effectively by behaving like that substrate would behave. So you can see that choosing the substrate is only the first behavior. But what you do when you get there is the second behavior in terms of stillness or movement or orienting the body in such a way to try and match the aspect of the environment most effectively. Now, camouflage basically means hiding in the environment and not being detected. But visual camouflage is only one form if we recognize that there are other ways to be detected. In some cases, it may be an effective camouflage to be able to smell like the environment somehow. In the case of a species of skipper butterfly larva, it may be at risk of being detected because of its smell, as it feeds and pupates in a little chamber it builds inside of some leaves that it rolls up and knits together with silk. But if it's living in this chamber, and it is in a very distinct location in the environment, the concern here from an evolutionary perspective is that it could be detected by predators, not so much visually speaking, because it's visually hidden. However, there could be another cue that would allow the detection from predators, such as, for example, a buildup of feces as it's feeding in there. Such an odor as this could attract predators. Well, given that this is a real risk and a real danger in evolutionary time, this skipper butterfly larva has come up with a unique solution to not being detected because of the smell of its fecal pellets in its little sheltered chamber. These ingenious caterpillars have evolved a way of excreting their feces as pellets that are catapulted and shot away like a cannonball. It ends up shooting the poops well far away and allowing it to rid itself of these potential stink bombs that might allow it to get detected by predators. We must recognize that predators can and will use all of their senses to locate their food. So if smell can be an important cue that could be used by the predators to find their prey, then this poop shooter adaptation is clearly effective use of camouflage by the skipper. 
In most instances, the anti-predator survival behaviors that we have seen have been somewhat intuitive and reasonable sounding. And then sometimes we see prey animals doing odd things and behaving in seemingly paradoxical ways in the face of danger, such as a lizard who will stop and do push-ups, or a Thompson's gazelle which stots which is jumping around and making a big show of themselves and basically saying, look at me, look at me, look at me, which seems to be a strange thing to do, especially if there's a predator around, like a cheetah lurking off in the bushes. You would think that this would not be the most appropriate behavior in that context. Obviously, you're bringing attention to yourself instead of to the others. If you're thinking about minimizing the risk of spreading that risk onto the others, doesn't seem like a good strategy to be drawing attention to oneself. These stots, which are amazing leaps and bounds, clearly must take up a lot of energy. So in a dangerous situation, when a predator is nearby, not only are they trying to make themselves more conspicuous, but they're also expending huge amounts of energy. Now, what is the point of this? Could it be a communication between the prey and the predator itself? Well, it turns out that not all of these Thompson gazelles actually do this stotting. Only some of them do. And it appears that the ones that stot are chased less frequently by the predators and they're caught less often than the other non-stotting gazelles around them. It could be that the purpose of stotting is to advertise some kind of proficiency, to tell the predators something about the quality of that individual. And then, if the predator actually pays attention to this, it would be win-win for both that stotting prey and the predator who doesn't chase after the prey who are so energetic and so healthy that they'll get away anyways. This makes the stotting behavior to communicate information that is known as honest signaling. That is, it's an honest representation of their state, being energetic and physiological state of general health. Basically, because this is a behavior that you can't fake. You can either do it or you can't. And if you can do it, it implies that you're better than the ones that can't. So it therefore is a form of communication that is adaptive, allowing both predators and the strongest prey to benefit from. And it happens to be another way of being selfish and spreading the risk by taking the immediate danger away from oneself and placing it on any of the nearest and weaker neighbors. When we observe different animals choosing to behave in different ways from one another or in different contexts even, we should wonder whether or not amongst the range of behaviors that animals could choose to do, are they doing the right one? If there will be a different range of behaviors that could be chosen, they're not all going to be as adaptive as one another, right? In the case of the dugongs, Australian aquatic mammals that are a lot like our North American manatees or sea cows, they have some kinds of feeding behaviors that don't seem to be very adaptive at first glance. They're very slow-moving animals that swim around in very shallow water, feeding most of the time. Now, they have two kinds of feeding behaviors. One is cropping the standing grasses which basically means feeding on all of the emergent vegetation that's growing out of the sandy bottom of their aquatic environment. This form of feeding behavior is not really very nutritious at all because, well, it's just basically grasses. However, they also have this alternative feeding strategy by uprooting the rhizomes that are buried in the sand. These are much more nutritious, with much more bang for your buck, if you will, with respect to the nutrients that you get out of those. However, all of that excavating behavior causes the sediment dust to silt up and then clouds up their environment, which makes it so that these dugongs can't see very well around themselves in this silty, clouded water. Now, dugongs aren't the only animals in these intertidal areas, where there will also be sharks. What we find is that when the sharks are nearby, the dugongs spend less time digging for those yummy and nutritious rhizomes and more time grazing on the bland grasses. As biologists observing these feeding behaviors, we might easily conclude that the dugongs are feeding suboptimally, 
because they're avoiding the better food source. But that wouldn't be seeing things quite rightly from the dugong's perspective. It turns out that the feeding strategy chosen would have a big impact on the risk of threat from predators. Meaning, it's much more dangerous to have your head in the ground with silt everywhere and you can't see. So even if it's a better food source, you can't eat anything if you're dead. So clearly they're adjusting their feeding strategy away from what they would prefer to be doing in ideal situations. Decisions are made by animals on a day-to-day -day basis in order to undertake the most appropriate behavior at any given time, but also as a function of avoiding any potential costs or risks that may be out there that are also part of one's environment. This makes it important to take into account this factor known as the risk effect on the decision-making by animals. And when we do, we can see more clearly that they are in fact behaving adaptively. In conclusion, what we've seen here is that it's the goal of every animal to survive and to eventually reproduce. One of the ways we survive is by feeding ourselves. But it's important to note that we can't eat if we've become food for someone else. And we can't reproduce either. So a lot of our behaviors take into account that if we're not careful, we could easily become food for another organism. And that these need to be balanced against a series of other behaviors, sometimes conflicting ones, like potentially finding a mate and hoping to get reproductive opportunities, another important component to fitness. And this needs to be calculated into the decision-making process of all creatures. If we're truly going to understand why animals behave the way that they do, we need to take into account this balance this unspoken equation that governs life for virtually all animals.